We are a people that, as uh, someone said earlier, Stan, we can do nothing without you. Not a thing. But with you, Lord, uh, stepping out of the way, we will fulfill everything you've called us to do by your power, by your spirit, in your time, in your way. And for that, Lord, we stay uh, focused on our allegiance to you because of who you are and what you desire to do in and through us, Lord, that's going to honor and glorify you. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen. 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 Uh, so I want to I uh, make sure I'm ready here. I want to encourage you with this, <clears throat> for those of you that are watching the, uh, the news. Uh, our country's had four awakenings, four times when it looked impossible for the landscape to change, four times the church refocused on Christ, and four times we had an awakening, 1735, 1805, 1885, and 1965. So uh, just encourage you. And then I also want to share this with you. We had uh, the greatest life giver of all time come during the greatest tyrancy. Uh, Roman Empire, to my knowledge, is still the most wicked and ruthless rule that the world has ever known as far as like, for the most part, ruling most of the known world then. And uh, Jesus decided to enter the world when everything looked like it was sideways, to change the world. You're not smiling. I'm telling you, we serve the victor. And the greatest, highest, most faith-filled most faith prayer that we as the body of Christ could ever pray is this one. 100% positive this. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's the prayer of courage. All right. I have two clipboards here. <clears throat> These are, if you would, just see some things listed on both clipboards. They're things that I'd like for Christmas. <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, I'd like to pass these around. Right now we have six categories. And out of these six categories, there are uh, places that we want to encourage you to serve. Yeah, you might uh, feel like, well, I'm, you know, children's ministry, ushering, greeters, small group leaders, assistant leaders, uh, nursery. And you may go, well, none of those really... I feel called to. So we, we'll be adding to these, but there's some that we're just feeling like, man, we're the body of Christ, we're a family. And uh, as uh, Stan was, I think one of the first things that he did last summer was pass uh, around a survey. And one of the primary things on the survey was that one of our strengths as a church was our family feel, our community, that we believe that there's something unique that God is doing here. Um, so <clears throat> we want to bring the family in and figure out what you're supposed to be doing and where you're supposed to be. And I want to pass these around when they finally are completely passed around. And I know it's summer and we have a lot of people out. But if you would look at these, there are two sheets on each, one's, each one of these boards. There's not a pencil or pen attached to it. My apologies. Once they've gone around, if uh, Tim or somebody will place them in the back, and after the Holy Spirit has moved on you, you can still go back after the service and fill one of these in. So, we'll get these going. Steve, I put you down for cook. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Next Sunday is, uh, Stan, Dr. Stan said, we're going to come together, have fellowship, and have a potluck. We'll send out some information and text, and uh, you can just, we'll just share how we, we haven't done one of these in a very, very long time, but we'll come together, but we're also going to, uh, install two new elders next Sunday. So please, please, please make sure that you're part of that. We have uh, one more thing before I dive into the sermon, and that is uh, the Craig family is going to, uh, they're going to go through a great adventure. <coughs> Are they not, Michael? So uh, I'd like for uh, Clayton and Carlin and the children, if they would all come up here. I know they're here somewhere. There they are. Clayton is about to 
be deployed to Kuwait. And he, this will be their, his last Sunday with us for until December. And we, hey, Alice, I just remember baptizing you not too long ago. It was a not, it was a more than a month ago. So I'd like for us, if we could, let's stand with this family just as a symbol that we are with them on this adventure and we're gonna pray for them and ask the Holy Spirit just to watch over them. And every single divine opportunity that they have, I spent a lot of, a lot of time, fair amount of time talking with Clayton over coffee. And uh, so I think God, God has this, but we love you guys and we're with you, you're part of the family. Father, we just wanna pray in Christ's name Knowing that when we pray in Christ's name, we are really, if we're doing it correctly, we are presenting all of your qualities and characters and abilities that you have. So we are praying in your name, Lord Jesus Christ, and asking you to surround this family, that you would encourage them, that this would be a time of uh, building up and not tearing down. I pray, Lord, that it'll be a time when you uh, bring some components into their walk as a family, some things that I know they've been pouring into their, their children and each other as husband and wife, principles that they get to uh, devote themselves to maybe than they uh, have before. A lot of those principles and characteristics. Watch over the kids, we pray, Lord. We ask you to protect their hearts and their minds in Christ Jesus. Lord, we just ask uh, Carlin, just, uh, she is very well equipped and sharp, and I just pray that she would draw in those things that you have given her Holy Spirit from your word, uh, things that you have taught her so very long, Lord, and let her be just stand as a woman of God in your might, in your power, trusting in you. And I pray for Clayton, Lord, as the father of this family. Watch over him, Lord Jesus, I pray. Keep him safe wherever he is. Lord, let who he is in Christ speak for you in every situation that he is in. And we just pray in the name of Jesus Christ that we will surround these guys from now until we're rejoined with Clayton in December. And we pray for them in Christ's name, for Christ's sake, and for Christ's glory. The body of Christ said, amen. 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 Genesis class is next door if you want to go. So for the past several months, <clears throat> um, I sent some things that I've really been, really for almost a year, trying to core down and seek the Lord. You guys that have been Christians a long time, you know how you reach places sometimes, you just go, okay, I really want to. This happened to me more than a decade ago, probably a decade and a half, two decades ago. Uh, I was in Central America with some of the guys from the church, and uh, during that time, I started, I was just going through this thing where I was going, well, I wonder if I love God because I really love God, that's really in my heart, or is it just become such a habitual thing that I just go through certain motions and it's not this fired up thing that's really in my heart? <clears throat> and um, the second question I asked was, what is a church supposed to look like, the church as a whole in the Western culture at this point in history? So uh, I, uh, I answered that first question. I was really thinking that, like when I, and I've shared this before, so I'll be fast. When I first met Diana and we first started dating and went in to pick her up for our first date, her father was sitting at the, uh, I'm sorry to say her husband. Her husband was sitting at the table and I said, well, I'd like to take the wife out but. <laughs> Uh, her father was sitting at the table and uh, kind of a small man and he had been through a lot of physical things and he was sitting there holding a cup of coffee and uh, I, was, I was extremely nervous and I was not a Christian and uh, I had hair, it was, was long, uh, down to my shoulders or so and uh, so he was kind of the opposite of me and he said, sit down and have a cup of coffee. I just said, sure. Never had coffee before in my entire life at that point in time. <clears throat> that was my introduction to coffee. And it's been a habitual thing ever since. But sit down and uh, now after all these years, I think, do I really like coffee? Do David King and I really like coffee as much as we, like, we think we like coffee? Or is it just a habit? And I really like coffee. I really do. 
multiply that times infinity, and I was asking myself the same question about my relationship with Jesus Christ. Do I really love the Lord because I do? If took everything away and every opportunity away and all I had was he and I, do I really love him with all my heart? And that question got answered pretty quickly. It was, yeah, he's my life. He saved my life. He's my life. I want to serve him the rest of this earth life. The second question has been a little bit more difficult uh, for me to track down, and that is, what is the church supposed to look like in this hour? How do we become more effective? So the last few months, I've been repeating this process, and these are the four things that I've been asking myself for almost uh, since about September of last year. What defines a genuine follower of Christ? What defines a genuine follower of Christ? Second, what is God's vision for his church? You know, sometimes we hear all these vision statements. We go to these conferences, pastor do, pastors do, and church leaders, and we get all these ideas and concepts and strategies about how to get more people and reach more people and that sort of thing. But what is God's vision for his church? Thirdly, what are the primary characteristics of his church? And then finally, how are those characteristics effectively pursued, practiced, and presented in our culture today, and specifically in our realm of influence, guys, Hope Fellowship. How do we translate all of those things that's in the vision of and heart of God for his church? And I just hadn't asked myself that question in a very long time, but started asking those four questions again last September. So the first question, what defines a genuine follower of Christ? Man, the, the scriptures are full of examples that we can draw, that we can glean from the Bible and answer those pretty easily. Followers of Christ, the body of Christ, that is the church, were to be a people wholly devoted to become like Christ in his values, in his character, and in his mission. That's the core values. This is the heart of the Father for his sons and daughters. These characteristics, man, we're just, we just find them all through the Gospels, all through the New Testament. The, the next two questions, I'm going to drink some water here in a second. And you don't have any, I know, probably. The next two questions I drew from Acts chapter 2, verse 42. They devoted themselves, and the word devoted means they were just honed in. And it's like these, these things we do with total devotion. We do other things in the world. We have jobs. We have uh, other interests, hobbies. But these four things, when we come together as Christ's body, the church, these four things are present. These four things are effective. The apostles' teachings. We now have the apostles' teachings in the Word of God. So they were avid learners and appliers of the Word of God. They were av very, very focused in their teaching, very focused in their fellowship, very focused in their devotion of the Lord's Supper, and very effective and devoted in their prayer life. Four basic things in Acts 2.42, and I, I used Acts 2.42 to answer questions two and three for me. I'm still there. I use them as my lens, sort of, to kind of go, okay, what's it supposed to be like? If everything, was, if everything went away and all I had was the Bible, what kind of church is supposed to represent Jesus Christ in this hour, in this place, by this body, to our community and wherever else he wants to send us. If no one was there and all I had was this book, is this book enough so that I could be assured that I had the manual of success? The answer to that is yes, 100%. So I used Acts 2.42 as my searchlight attempting to see best I could and then I started looking, how have these four things in Acts 2.42, with everything that goes around them, 
How have they fared? How have, the, how have they fared since its inception at the early church through all of church history to now? And it's been a wild ride, and I'm still riding it. But it's amazing every single time that you find the church beginning to back up and get away from all the peripheral things that we think are needed for us to have church, and they get back to focusing on, on Jesus and going, what's your vision? What is your will for the church? How do we act like Christians? So far in my studies, every single time, there is an awakening. There is a renewal against all odds. You should read. I challenge you to read. Go read about the Great Awakening. Go read about the history of our country just prior to the Great Awakening taking place. Go look at the condition of the church. Go look at the political values of the guys that were running our country. It was tough. It was anti-God. But you're kidding me. What about the Puritans? I thought they were all about God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But go to the condition of the church, the condition of the country prior to the Great Awakening. And there were a lot of people that were writing historically about, man, I don't know if we're going to make it. And you know what modern historians say about the Great Awakening? If we hadn't had the Great Awakening, we would not have the country that we do today. So, man, I think we're teed up. <laughs> I've never seen it bad in my lifetime. We are teed up for a Great Awakening. And I want to be part of it. Amen? Amen. Somebody needs to go get some. <coughs> Lots of coffee. Okay, so the fourth thing, what does it look like today? What is the vision of Jesus Christ for His church, this body of believers, Hope Fellowship, right now? Maintaining the status quo? Uh-uh. Going back to where we were? Well, if we have, let's pull those good DNA values from those things, and we can retain those. But it's like when Diane and I used to do premarital counseling. She would always say to the couple, probably said it to Josh and Megan, what are the things that you want to draw that were good from your parents' marriage? And what are the things you want to leave in their household and not bring into your marriage? So the things that we have that God has used in this church for over three decades, let's, let's retain those things. The things that worked are probably the things that God instructed us to do and things that we found very valuable and decided to apply them from the Word of God. The things that didn't work, that were built around men, they don't need to stay. I love history and being able to go back and go, never. The defining moment for the church throughout the history of the church is every single time they lay their lives down and say, we want to be like you, Lord Jesus. That's the defining moment, every single time even when there was persecution, even when the government was not uh, being so nice to Christianity, even when the world was frowning upon it. You know, don't forget, the church was looking good in Jerusalem when the day of Pentecost came and the Holy Spirit fell and everybody was hearing there the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news, that's what was being spoken among them out in the streets. That was the day of Pentecost. And people were hearing the good news of Jesus Christ in their own language. God provided a miracle so that everyone would hear the gospel of Jesus Christ in that instance. And man, the church started exploding. It started growing and everything was going their way. And man, everybody was doing a podcast and there was all kinds of different things that were happening. And the Lord came down and stirred the pot. And he sent the church... Focus in Jerusalem. Into the places of the world where the gospel had not been heard. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. That's the most powerful prayer a believer, a follower in Christ will ever pray, bar none. So I wrote this little note to the, uh, to the elders and fellow leaders, I don't know, two or three weeks ago. <clears throat> My appeal to God for myself, Craig Smith, and to you as leaders, is that through and by the power of God, the grace of God, we all surrender our opinions and our paradigms and emerge from time in the Word, in prayer, 
And we will emerge with hearts refreshed, spirits renewed, and visions excluded of all content but the vision of Christ for his church and the vision of Christ for Hope Fellowship going forward. When we commit ourselves to pursuing the teachings of Jesus, there will be blessing and there will be good effect. How do I know this? Because I know God blesses what he has clearly shown as his desire and will for all genuine followers of Jesus Christ. You know, I've been watching uh, Ed, Julian, and Josh Lindsay, and Zach, Julian, wire, they're doing wiring at, at the village, converting the big old giant bar into a place of transformation. And man, there's wires everywhere. Just stuff scattered there, hooking wires, and you know, I'm, I go in and just look at what they're doing. They're hooking wires up the walls and bringing this one up and over to that one. And, uh, they're putting it all together, and at some point in time, they're going to flip a switch. And if they've done everything correctly, there's going to be power to every place in that building. They can wire it all up perfectly, which I've asked them to do, by the way. <coughs> but it still has to be hooked up to the power source, right, Josh? That's where they have to depend on, did the city do their job? And if the city did do their job, man, once the power's hooked up and the, the switch is flipped, power to the whole thing. That is what I believe is my illustration for when God, when we do God's will, God's way, we get God effects. When we do things, I know that sounds real, maybe that's the, uh, I'll let that be the theme for this morning. When we do things, when we do God's will, God's way, we will get God effects. Because he's plainly put this out there. If you do these steps, if you'll wire everything the way it's supposed to be wired and hook up with a power source, I'll bless that. But all this other stuff, I don't know. I want to give you three passages this morning. I very much believe, <clears throat> now I've shared this during COVID and coming out of COVID. And I had no idea that so many things were gonna even go politically sideways as they have in our country, or look at the world, or that we're on the brink of World War III, so close, closer than I've ever been in my life time. And so trusting is God is like, well, and we all think of our kids and our grandkids, and uh, is God out of control? No, he's been about a plan from the time he created man, from the time he created humanity. That plan was to gather a people for himself who would worship him for all eternity. And he had to send Jesus Christ to redeem the world. He had to send Jesus Christ so that he could fix all of the things that were done wrong. And religion was kind of blaming things on different ways, you know, uh, you know, you guys know I love animals, this isn't in my notes. Um, I loved animals, I love animals, it's a, when I, but when I came, became a believer in Jesus, I thought, man, there's uh, the animal, the kingdom, animal kingdom is just nuts to me since I've become a Christian. So it was pretty fascinating before I even believed that God created everything, but now it's just fascinating to me. Well, there's a gorilla named Coco, maybe you've read about it somewhere, there's a gorilla named Coco. Coco is, uh, was taught sign language. And uh, Coco, I don't know, knows a thousand plus sign. It might be thousands at this point. I really don't know what it is. And she's very docile. So th one of the few things that they did, or first things they did, was they put, <coughs> they put a little kitten in with uh, Coco. And she just cared. She was just so gentle with this little cat. And the cat grew, and she took care of the cat. You know, you can, just, you can go on, you can Google and see all kinds of pictures with the cat. And she just is very careful with the cat, take care of the cat. <clears throat> and one day they came to Coco's, uh, the place where they kept her, the room, the cage, and she had a sink. 
in her dwelling. And she had completely, it's a gorilla, gone to the sink and ripped it out of the wall and tore it on the ground. And so her trainer did sign language and said, Coco, why did you tear the sink off the wall? And she didn't look up. She just signed and said, the cat did it. <laughs> the father had to send the son into the world because we're always trying to dodge our sin. And we had no way to be restored to that relationship. It took Jesus Christ. And so the Lord has done that. I want to give you three scriptures to tell you why I'm really excited. And these are very familiar scriptures. And I'm finished for the morning. The first one is out of Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on Jesus to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, which is the, also the Sea of Galilee. And he saw two boats in the lake, but the fishermen had gone out, uh, gone out of them already. They were out of there, and they were washing their nets. And getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, Peter's, Jesus asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat in the boat, and he began to teach the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, Jesus turns to Peter, then called Simon, and says, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Peter, who had been out all night with his colleagues, fishing, tired, didn't catch anything, looks at Jesus after he'd been teaching the crowds and said, Master, we toiled all night and we took nothing. But at your word, I will let down the nets. There is um, something that, until I started studying this this past week, that I'd never seen before or didn't know about. And that is that when they fished during this time frame, they used one type of netting, which was one type of color, during the day for day fishing and one type of fishing uh, net when they fished at night. And it was, the one they used at night was of uh, the nature uh, so that the fish could not see that the netting was there. So not only was Peter going, Lord, we just spent the entire night out on the water and we've caught nothing. There's, there aren't any fish around here. And he could even add to that, and besides, we have nets. These are night nets, and they're going to see the night nets during the daytime. But Peter said, okay, because you want me to, I will. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish. They caught a large number of fish in their nets, and their nets were breaking. You know the story. They signaled to their partners and the other boat to come and help them because there was so much, it was pulling the, they could, just couldn't get it into the boat. They came and filled both boats so that the two boats began to sink. And then Simon Peter saw it and he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. The cat didn't do it. I did it. I'm a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken, and also were with him James and John's sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and they followed him. When we do God's will, God's way, we get God results. Let your nets down again, guys. Lower your nets yet again. When we do God's will, God's way, we get God results. 
And God's results are always those that we don't have the capacity to do on our own. He always gives us an adventure that's greater for us to pursue than we can possibly reach or produce the fruit of in our own flesh every single time. Now, does that mean, oh, man, that means, what are you saying, Craig? So, man, if I do the will of the Lord, I'm just going to, I'm going to have four houses and 16 cars and everybody's going to love me on every single block where I've got the houses and nobody's ever going to yell at me again. I'm not going to get any traffic tickets. I'm going to sing, the sun will come out tomorrow, every day. Your kingdom come, your will be done. The greatest prayer, a follower, a genuine follower of Jesus and not just someone who attends church. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Greatest prayer, bravest prayer that a follower of Jesus can possibly pray. Safest prayer that a follower of Jesus can possibly pray. Let's look at Matthew 6, chapter 25. I won't read this. I won't take the time to do this. But this is the story where Jesus begins to build. He's a sermon on the mountain. He's now talking about not worrying about what we need, what we need to eat, what we need to dress ourselves. In essence, he's saying, don't be focused on all of those things in the peripheral of your life. Don't be focused on those things that go away, that are temporary. And then that beautiful passage is in Matthew 6, 33. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things that you need will be provided. You know, there's a parallel passage that, I mean, parallel passage, but he, in the same Sermon on the Mount that he shared, and that's in the Lord's Prayer, 6, 9 through 13 of Matthew, when he says, well, go to the Father first, Remember, the disciples came to him, the followers of Christ. They came to him and said, teach us to pray. The very first thing that he said is, okay, our Father in heaven, God first always. Your name is holy. It's all about you. Always has been, always will be. Your kingdom come, he said, and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That was the second primary thing that Jesus taught. And then thirdly, he finally gets to give us today our daily bread. The daily bread that Jesus has us pray for is to fulfill the kingdom of God, the will of God for our particular assignment, for the assignment he has as a body of believers, for assignment that he has for us as individuals. We take that passage out of context like we so much do. It's all about God. When you make it all about God, as we try to do, every step closer to Christ, and still, like, the closer I get to Him and the more I want to be with Him, the more I want to, want to be like Him, the, the, the closer I get to the light, the more I realize I'm still so much not like you, Lord Jesus. But, oh, man, I, I want to be like you. Because the Father said, that's your will for every single follower of Jesus to become nothing so that we become something of value for the Father. So Jesus says, seek first. Let everything else in your life as a follower of Jesus just pale in comparison to pursuing Jesus Christ. But you know, every step that I take, and I realize I'm so unlike him, still every step, that I take closer to him. All these other things in the world, you guys, they just become less and less and less important to me. Do I love my wife of 52 years? Yes, she said, don't tell them. One more time, we've been married 52 years. (laughs) Tell them we're 52 years old. 
I love my wife, my kids, my grandkids. I love them. But even Diana would tell you this, because we talk about this a lot. Compared to our relationship with Jesus, Jake, everything is so pale and dim in the distance. So those steps, every step I take toward Jesus and I get my flesh exposed more and more and more, but he says, come on, come on, closer, closer, closer. But every step I take, less of the world fascinates me. Less of the world do I want. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That is, how can I know for sure that I'm seeking the kingdom of God? How can I know and how can you know that we are being righteous like Jesus is saying to come to him? How do we know that? Once again, the beauty and simplicity of our Father is that he gives us Jesus Christ and his character and his values, glaringly simple to understand, though more difficult to walk out. He puts those characteristics in the Bible for me to know. Don't judge. Love everybody. Can't do that. No, not on my flesh. It takes your Holy Spirit. If you want to lead, get in the back of the line. The humility of Jesus. The humility of Jesus, my friends, is the key to success in the kingdom of God. Getting rid of yourself is the key to seeing God's will fulfilled, God's way, with God's effect in your life. A genuine follower of Christ is one who just cannot get enough out of here. He's hungry, she's hungry to know more of how Jesus did things and how Jesus would have you do things, me do things. And depending upon the Holy Spirit to make it possible to do those things. When we do God's will, God's way, we get God's results. I'm sure of that. I'm 100% committed to that. I'm positive of that. I want us all to believe that. Put down your nets again, no matter where you are. Put down your net. Push out into the deep. Let your nets down even though everything that you've tried to place up there numerous times, oh, we've done this so many times before, I just don't have the energy to do it again. That's the way Peter was. I can't do this again. Treasures are in the kingdom. Amen? I want to show, uh, Josh, uh, would you I want to show something that this took place three days ago. I might have to turn the lights off if we can't. This was a last minute thing, but three days ago, some people, uh, you can just show it if you would. So what you're seeing, there's 50,000 people that are in a stadium in Anaheim, California. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people came to know Jesus three days ago. Anaheim, California. Correct me if I'm wrong, but is it? California and the specific, the LA area and New York, two of the most liberal, ungodly places within the other 50 nations that we have. I heard a few guys out there say, God isn't finished yet. It doesn't matter what the politicians are saying, it doesn't matter what the politicians are doing. The kingdom of God will abide forever. We're committed. Heard him say this. We are committed to the teachings and the values of Jesus Christ from the Word of God. We don't care. We're praying. I heard this very clearly. You may not be able to quote this, but Greg Laurie was saying, man, I'm, I'm so glad President Trump was delivered and not killed. And we pray for him. But he said... I would have said the same thing had President Biden's been assassinated attempt. Why? 
because that's what the Lord says to do. Is it hard for me to do? It's very hard. Very, very hard. But we are on a mission. And man, I want to finish it with the zeal that God has to fire up our little hearts. Let your nets down again. Okay. Dare to believe, dare to obey, dare to trust God for the results. When we do God's will, God's way, we get God's results. That's the essence of these three passages that we've looked at. The Lord is going to always, if we, he would, he would not be telling us to let our nets down, and I'm not bringing it in here to Hope Fellowship. He wouldn't tell us to let our nets down anymore to try it one more time because he knows nothing is impossible with him. He knows that if men and women will get out of the way, if we'll, if we'll seek him for his vision of his church, that we'll see success as defined by God. We have an assignment. I've got an assignment. Do you have an assignment? Are you a follower of Jesus? If you, have a, if you are a follower of Jesus, I mean, you genuinely receive that grace and you meant it, and everybody else is not here this morning. If we said, I want your grace, guess what? You got an assignment that came with it. And it's an assignment that it's very important to God that it's completed. And it is an assignment that he will provide everything that's necessary to see you do that assignment victoriously, because that's his will. And it's an assignment for which he will get all the honor and the glory. And believe it or not, our little hearts are going to explode with gratitude and joy and fulfillment because we did his will and not ours. A couple of weeks ago, um, if you were here, <clears throat> we were just talking about our church and moving forward. And, and all three of the elders feeling like, okay, there's some things that we need to do to readjust ourselves. And Stan was very honest and wonderful and uh, seeking the Lord and uh, Daryl Kirkland also who is not with us he's in South Africa this morning <clears throat> and uh, and Diane and I and I'm sure the rest of you guys uh, so we got to a good place we got to the place to a destination where we realized well we we know uh, some things we're not supposed to do and uh, that's a beautiful place to be now I know what I'm not supposed to be. If I tried to be Bill Stuckey, I would fail at it. He's a great problem solver. If I tried to be better for you guys for this example, let's say that you all made dental appointments with me this week. <laughs> How many would suddenly cancel that appointment? If you have any wisdom at all, you would. Every single one of us have a calling and an assignment. And it doesn't mean it's going to be the same one for the rest of our lives. But it does mean that we, as followers of Jesus, trust him that he is orchestrating this thing of, of beauty. And we're still on mission. Hope Fellowship, you're still on mission. And I think if we do God's will, God's way, we'll get God effects as we're going forward because each one of us have a role. Each one of us have an assignment. Each one of us play a part. And I just think he's growing us up to the next place. It's the next rung on the ladder. And we step up. So on the practical side of this, please, you know, I told Stan and Daryl, I, I think I have some vision and some things for the church that I don't know that I've had in years. 
And I wouldn't have seen these things if I hadn't been out on the outside, so to speak, and dealing with what we were doing from village to village. One of those things was, uh, man, it's kind of fun when you're the leader because sometimes the other guys tell you what to do or you tell them what to do. So quite frankly, one of the things that I had to learn was could I submit to Stan and Daryl? I mean, really submit to what they wanted to do and kind of get out of the way. And could I learn from that? It's kind of humbling after doing it 30, 30 plus years and going, hey, I, <clears throat> all right, I'm going to come underneath you guys and, and I really want you to succeed and I want you to do well and as we look and see what the next step is. So God throws those little gems at you sometimes going, oh, you think you're pretty good. Huh? Well, let's see if you can... Why don't you get in the back seat and ride for a little while? See how you like the landscape, you know? Only with me, it was more like, why don't you just get out of the car for a little while and see things from afar? And I did, and I learned some things, and I got fired up about some things. But that doesn't mean, please, tell your friends. I heard a guy say that recently. Tell your friends. So I'm telling you, but tell your friends, so need my family and your giftings. The elders so need your giftings and who you are and what you do and your skills so that we can collectively, so that we can corporately come together and make the next steps that God wants us to make. I do believe this. I don't think it's a cliche or just a, fancy little line. I think if we will do God's will, God's way, we'll get God effects. I'm not so sure that we've, we may, you know, some of us have been around for a long time. We may look back in our journals and go, well, you know, 25 years ago, this, this was going on. Let's quit living in the past. I don't want to live in the past. And I sure don't have a whole lot of future <laughs> to go. But I want it to end well. I want to do my part, my assignment, my place, and no more. Amen? So if you didn't sign a little place on the clipboard, this is not a whole sermon to go, did you sign the clipboard? I promise. There's a lot more things. Our stimuli, the stimuli of the kingdom, the effectiveness, is once we draw those qualities of Jesus out, is we go in prayer and say, make me like you. And as you're making me like you, those things that you've given me, those assignments, that assignment, let me plug into the body of Christ, your church. And let this church, because we're just one expression of the church in our river valley. And how can we plug in more so with the other fellowships in our river valley? And who knows, someday, and I'm not just saying this, you know, it's 100% possible it's 100% possible that if we just obeyed the Lord, if we just took the things from the Word of God and did what He said to do, that we could see awakening begin in the River Valley of Fort Smith. We have a global imprint already. This little body of believers on this piece of property, Hendricks Boulevard, which doesn't seem very significant to a lot of us. It's family for those of us to come. I right, but... We have a global imprint. And it's not, it's not just me by any stretch. We have Minute and Hannah. We have missionaries that are out there. We have other people that used to call this home that are, that are out there that are doing things for the kingdom. A lot of things that were birthed here. So let's make genuine followers of Jesus. Amen? Let's stand. Two weeks ago, we, I asked, would you guys just please, 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 please be in prayer? That's our weapon. That's our strength. It's our might. It's our muscle. Go to the Lord. Listen to the Lord. Be obedient to the Lord. Go to the Lord and ask him how much, what things don't look like you, Jesus, and what can, things can you work on me that will be more like Christ? 
What's your vision for your church in the Western world? What is your vision for the church in the River Valley? What is your vision of this church, Hope Fellowship? How can we remove all of our opinions and our paradigms and set those aside, things that aren't you necessarily, to embrace the things that we know for certain are things that you have mandated us to do? So let's pray for those things. Lord, I pray for everyone that is here, everyone that might hear this message. I ask you, God, that we would pray the strongest and mightiest prayer. Our Father in heaven, holy is your name. It will never change. It will not diminish. It will not vary. You are the king of of your kingdom, you're the creator and the maker of all things. You are Jehovah God. Lord, may your kingdom, every quality, every characteristic, everything that's in your heart and in your mind for this day, this hour, these people, let those characteristics be the foundation and the establishment for our living, Lord God, and may your will be done in our lives. In the church this nation. Wake it up. Clean it up. Align it with the word of God. And where it's gotten off course drastically, bring her back to you as you can so well do, Lord. I think that's what you've been in the process of doing. It's so much clearer to see the light from the darkness, even in the thing that is called the church in the United States. Your kingdom qualities, God. Bring them to the church at large. Bring them to the church in the River Valley. Bring them to the church on Hendricks Boulevard. Bring them into our individual lives. Let us have the courage and the wisdom to pray that prayer. And then we pray your will, God. Your will. Let it be done and bringing it home to right here on Hendricks Boulevard. Let your will be done in this church, Hope Fellowship. What is in your mind's eye? What is your assignment for us? Let us see it fulfilled. And Lord, we pray for every provision that is necessary the ones that are not necessary, cast them aside. The ones that are from our vain imaginations, let them fall aside. The provisions that are needed to fulfill what you're calling us to do, God, you will bring those because it's what you will bless. You always bless your will, always. So bring what is needed, Lord. Align my heart, align the leadership's heart, Align everybody that caused this church home. Align our hearts with the person of Jesus Christ. And could you do it, Lord, like it's not been done before? Could you renew and refresh? Could you bring that wind that only you can bring? Would you fill our hearts with hope? Would you fill our hearts with your vision? Would you enact the energy supernaturally that are going to be needed, that are going to be necessary so that we are putting our hands to the plow, but we are trusting you for guidance, trusting you for the energy to glean from these, the treasures that are in the field that we're supposed to be plowing from. You are a king of an everlasting kingdom whose dominion is forever and ever. So where there's been disillusionment, I pray against it in the name of Jesus Christ. Where there has been failures, we confess them. May you align us with you in your will, Lord Jesus. May we have the courage and the zeal to just dare to believe you. It's in your name we pray.
Amen. You are dismissed.